Welcome in, everybody, for another Nice Job live chat. It's Thursday. We're back again, and it's actually going to be the end of season one of our little live chat series and our, on our podcast series. Thank you so much to everyone that has supported, that has sent in uh, not just good feedback, but ones that were trying to help us make this show better, give us some tips of, of what we wanted to see and, and what you wanted to get out of this podcast. So it's really as much as people are, have been sending me messages that they're excited and congratulating me as we come towards the end of season one, it's all you out there that are consuming this content. So if you're liking what you're seeing, feel free to like it, to share it. If you're watching it on the replay, you still can do so. If you're listening on the audio only version, tell a friend, tell a colleague, tell your dog about it. Just tell someone about it. And let's see if we can take the knowledge that comes on this very podcast and get it out to the world at large. And that's what my guest today is very good at doing. It is actually when I first was hired at Nice Job, they asked me to look on, on YouTube, look in the podcast sphere and found find people that had a voice that spoke to the audience in such a way that there was an instant connection, but also had that expertise. So that's our topic today. You can call it becoming an expert or an industry leader. You can talk about educating your audience, whatever you want to title it. The first person that I started to find was Miss Angela Brown. Uh, ask a house cleaner, the house cleaning guru. Angela, what, what's the proper title that encompasses everything that you do? Well, I love the house cleaning guru, and I'll, I'll share a little secret with you. Uh, one of my clients called me the house cleaning guru. Oh, you're such a guru. And I said, oh, I love that. That's so awesome. But what I loved best about it was the words house cleaning in the, in the title house cleaning guru worked really well with search engine optimization. Mm -hmm. So by having that as my title, if you say Angela Brown, the house cleaning guru, then the words house cleaning traveled with that. So in order to build my brand, I said, that is an awesome title because it works well with SEO. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love just that answer there uh, is if, if you're just tuning in, it's going to give you a little insight of what Angela is going to bring to this discussion and bring to the table. But let's go back, I guess, just prior to being called the house cleaning guru. Uh, how did you get into the, the cleaning industry? You know, what, what put, set you on the entrepreneurial path? Um, I, I don't need the hospital you were born in, but a little backstory on Angela Brown for those that may not be familiar. Um, I, I've always been a little bit entrepreneurial in the sense that I grew up in a, a large family. I'm one of 19 kids. And because I was one of 19 kids, we were raised to be resourceful. And so as I started out on my own journey as a career person, I, I had to be resourceful and I didn't have any resources to start out with. I was waiting tables at a restaurant. I was delivering pizzas. I was delivering newspapers, just kind of strapping along, trying to pay bills. And uh, a girl that I worked at a, a restaurant with was also into house cleaning. And she tricked me into starting a house cleaning business with her. It lasted all of one day when I realized that our values were different. And so the following day, I, I quit her company that night, worked for her for exactly one day. And I started my own house cleaning company the next day when I realized the type of money I could make. What I did not know was that there would be this huge learning curve and that I would have to learn a whole lot about business and marketing and management and employees. And I mean, like what you just push a vacuum, right? <laughs> no, it's more than that. And so my journey over the last several years has been learning how to be the best version of myself so that I could be the best version for my clients. And I think that goes hand in hand with the nice job philosophy, where if you become the person that other people want to talk about, other people will talk about you. And it's, it's an interesting sort of mindset of an entrepreneur because there are a lot of flags at the beginning that display the risk, you know, that, that talk about uh, how many ways that you can fail. And a lot of people hail the entrepreneurial spirit as the ability to kind of to, to fight through and, and to get through that. Um, but there's a lot of skills and a lot of things that you have to learn along the way to really accomplish that. It's not just desire. There's a skill set that comes with it. What's the most important skill that you learned early on you think has served you the best along your journey as an entrepreneur? Well, oddly enough, it did not come from business. The oh. first skill set that I learned that was probably the most valuable and the most valuable to me to this day was learning how to train for marathons. I've run 29 marathons. And as you train for a marathon, there's a part of you that's half insane. And the same with small business owners, you're half insane. And the other part of you thinks, well, I, I can do anything. You think you're invincible. 
and you don't think you can fail. You think, well, I, I'll just go out and I'll, I'll just run, right? Yeah. But what you don't realize is there, there has to be a strategy if you're going to compete and there has to be a strategy if you're going to survive. And so you have to have consistent patterns in place. So you learn about systems. You have to get up every day at the same time and you have to go running and you have to run through wind and rain and snow and heat and hills and dips and valleys and flat roads. And you have to learn about what kind of shoes to wear and you have to learn about what kind of food to, to put in your body. So it's a, whole, it's a whole process. But then the goal at the end is this long journey that doesn't happen right away. It's not like I'm going to go out and I'm going to, I'm going to hit the track and in an hour I'll be done. It's a long journey. It takes weeks to prepare for a marathon. And the result at the end is 26.2 miles. And you're going to run that race. And at the end, you're going to be hot and sweaty and nobody's going to be left in the crowd. They're going to give you a Maillard blanket and a banana and you're going to go on your way and you'll, you'll, you'll be all alone again. <laughs> yeah. And so as a business owner, to, to transfer all of those ideas and to realize that I'm in this journey alone, I'm doing it because I want to be doing it. No one's holding me hostage. I choose to do this. It's not an immediate overnight result. It's going to take a long time. There are going to be a lot of pitfalls along the way. A lot of things are going to happen, but there's something that a marathon gives you. And there's something that small business gives you that no one else can take away. And when you go through and you finish a marathon, there is a sense of pride. There is a sense of glory. There's a sense of accomplishment. Of course, your endorphins have kicked in. A part of you will say, I'll never do that again. That was so crazy. And another part of you is like, you can't take that away from me. And it gives you this confidence, like I now can do anything. I started with nothing. I built something. I now can do anything. And so as I pivoted into my small business, I've been a professional house cleaner for 25 years. As I pivoted into the training world online, where I started to become an authority in my space, one of the things I had to realize is it was not going to happen overnight. It's like a marathon. You got to be here for the long haul. And I think one of the things they don't tell you in business is that if you're going to survive, you have to be able to think from today, 10 years down the road. If I do this today, what happens in 10 years from today? What does my business look like? It's really easy, especially on social media, to get caught up in these, I don't know, rants. There are trolls, there are haters, there, you know, and it's easy to just snap back at them and whatever without realizing. And th this is one of the things I love about reputation management is there are things that you have to think through. Anything that I say will be screenshotted and taken out of context. And you have to guard that with your life because 10 years down the road, that's still gonna come back to haunt you. And so every single thing you do, every move you make, it's like running the marathon. It's one step in front of the other, but only focusing on what's in front of you and knowing what the end goal is down the road. And that focus ahead, obviously, you know, there's a, the trials and tribulations might come ahead. You brought up reputation uh, management. Um, and what's great here at Nice Job is as we've as we've moved on now to to reputation marketing, which is not just going out and kind of you know collecting reviews and kind of getting reputation. It's taking the reputation you earned, kind of putting it to work for you. So the line I've used in a couple of podcasts is: you can go out and all your marketing, all your advertising, and say you're the best. But if you don't have the social proof to back that up, you probably technically aren't the best yet because that's when it really kind of comes together. And I think the building block of building a reputation as someone that can be top rated comes from positioning yourself as an expert. And I think sometimes there's a little bit where people might see themselves as, as the technician that's now just in charge, or they still think of themselves as purely the, the technical element of the job. Is there any advice you could give just before we get into how to take your expertise and really spread it, but anything of convincing yourself or identifying within you are an expert and what you can provide is going to be helpful to others. Well, yes. And it's not just, are you an expert? Because we're all an expert at something. If I were mm -hmm. to ask you today, could you, could you answer my question on Facebook? And I jump in your Facebook group and I ask a question without thinking about it, without saying, well, let's see, hmm, am I an expert? Can I answer that question? You just jump in and go, hey, try this, try that, right? We all know lots of things and we all know lots of different things. And you might only know a little bit about certain things, but what it comes down to is what is, what is it you want to be an expert in? And so in my profession, I'm a house cleaner. I've been a house cleaner for 25 years. So for me, it's not what I wanted to be when I grew up, but 
that's what God gave me. That's what's in front of me. It's, it's a pretty harmless profession. And so if I'm going to be an expert in house cleaning, I can't just wing it. I can't repeat year one of my business over and over and over again. I have to learn about pH balances and I have to learn about chemicals and I have to learn about safety data sheets and I have to learn about OSHA and OSHA safety, workplace safety. And I have to learn about personal protective equipment. Every day you have to learn new things in order to become the expert in your field, but also so that you can answer questions from your customers and from your employees and from the people that you work with. And so I didn't, I didn't set out to become the expert, but I realized for myself, if I'm going to be the best version of me for my business, I owe that to myself and I owe it to my clients. I owe it to my employees. I owe it to the people that, that I'm working with, right? Yeah. And so you have to make a commitment and it's not just like, oh, hey, I've been in the business for four weeks. I got it all figured out. I'm still learning things about this business and I've been in this business now for three decades. Yeah. And when it comes to clients, uh, you know, customers in that regard, um, obviously they are seeking out an expert using your Facebook example. That's classic, you know, marketing or sales and that stuff. It's just, there's a need, there's a question, there's something that perhaps you could answer. Um, and a poster may look through that thread and try to identify, well, which is the best answer for them. And that's kind of the core. You wrote SEO off the top of the show, that's Google trying to determine the best answer, you know, to the to the question posed. At times, though, uh, the more expertise you have, or the more you might be in a position to have a lot of knowledge, there might be a disconnect um, between your knowledge and how you may present it, and to the understanding of the person you're presenting it to. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the type of language you use, because I, I'm not a house cleaner. You rolled through a lot of things there, you know, pH bound. Like, I feel like I understand like, oh, like, get it. Like how, how, or what are your thoughts on the type of language you use? Is it always, there's some school of thought of, well, you present at the highest level because that's where it should be presented. And others are, if you can find ways to bring it down to a base level, I want to know where, where you stand on that. That is a great question. And the answer comes down to the industry that you're in. I'm in the house cleaning industry. And because I'm in the house cleaning industry, there are a lot of house cleaners. It's a low barrier to entry business. Pretty much anybody can just start a house cleaning business and maybe they've been cleaning their own homes or what have you. And so they have some skills that they're bringing to the table. But what I have to realize is we are a global company very, very quickly. There are people from all over the globe that come and they participate in our training. And so we have to understand English is not their first language. And so the, one of the rules that we have at Savvy Cleaner, which is the training company that I have right now that trains house cleaners and maids, is we have a rule. We have seven different filters that we run all of our content through because it has to be fifth grade education in order for us to release it. And for this reason, if English is not your first language, and I, I jumped on a podcast or a YouTube show and I said something like pontificate, <laughs> that does not translate. And so people are going to be scratching their heads saying, hmm, what, what does that mean? And I don't want you to lose what it is I'm saying, trying to figure out what it is I mean. And so every day when I walk in that I will have editors that are like, you used this word. I'm like, I didn't. Are you serious? What was I thinking? But it's, it's just being aware. And so now, even when I, I shoot a YouTube video, if I say something and it like slips out, I'll stop and I'll say, and what that means is, and I try to bring it back down to a level that makes sense. Not that my audience is not more educated, but I want it to translate in all the different languages. Now, uh, YouTube is brilliant for the fact that they have closed captioning. Mm -hmm. And so we do closed captioning on all of our videos. And what that means is our videos are readable in 191 languages. And so for every single video that we release, I have to trust that it's going to be translated into a variety of different languages. And something that I might say, like uh, this, this Christmas holiday, when that's translated, that's going to come up as Christmas vacation to other, other languages. And so you start thinking differently in terms of how, how will this be perceived from somebody that, that does not speak my, my normal language? And going back to your customers, it's okay if you go to a very simple conversation when you're speaking with customers, because I just threw out the word pH balance and personal protective equipment, but that's not common knowledge to most homeowners. That would be considered insider speak. And so that would be really important that my employees know that, but that's not important to a homeowner. So when I go to a homeowner, I have to say things like, we want to make sure that the chemicals we use on your countertop is safe and that we wear the right, um, uh, that we wear gloves while we're cleaning it or something like that. And then they would go, oh, I know what that means. Because you don't want your clients and customers to feel stupid. 
And so for us, it's not about sounding, sounding fancy. I, I spent a, the bulk of my life reading dictionaries and learning big words, and I was going to impress people with my knowledge. And it came down to now I'm, I'm scrapping everything that I learned. <laughs> and I'll take a word and I try to make it as simple as possible. And I might say, to make easy. Okay, we win, right? Yeah. And, and that's always, you can expand on that. that. That's the great thing about it, is having the, the high level knowledge and being able to translate it down. If a customer then came to you and said, well, what type of PPE are you using? you then might be able to throw out a more technical answer in that regard. And I think that helps expand your expertise. Uh, you you want to you keep it matched to the audience that you have. So, And so we, the next level from that is that, so you're the solo entrepreneur, you start to kind of bring on your team. Do you use this same sort of methodology when, you know, educating a, a client or a customer as you would when kind of building your team? Um, do you try to keep everything in a basic or is there a, a fundamental reason why you want to make sure that it is ramped up prior? Uh, in my opinion, I think the understanding would come if you give them kind of the expert knowledge on a little bit of the expert level, make sure they've, uh, you know, retained it and they absorb it. It allows them to kind of to translate down. But I wanted to kind of get your take um, or, or to kind of ask the specific question here is, is it just as important to use that same basic language in your training as it is perhaps your education to a customer or client? That's a great question. And I'm going to, I'm going to back step that by saying this, if I'm training you, I can tell you all the words and I can give you all the data and I can give you all the information and you can take notes and you can memorize and you can repeat it back to me, but it's still my data. It's not your data because you haven't taken ownership of it. And it's the same when we go to a customer's house. When we go to a customer's house, we do what's called a walkthrough. We walk through the house with the customer we look at their priorities. The reason we are there is to assess the job and to find out in our minds, is this a job I want, number one? Number two, is this something that I'm capable of doing? Is my company capable of doing the type of cleaning that they need? And if I come in and I say, well, we do this, 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 and this, that is my data. Now, people will always argue with your data but they will not argue with their own, right? We all wanna be right in our own heads. So my job in, in coming into your home to do a walkthrough is to find out what is your data, not what is my data. I know what my data is. I don't know what your data is. Now, if I just give you my data, I have this package, this package, and this package, you can argue with it and say, oh, the price is too high. That's not gonna work for us or whatever. And you can try to argue with my data. But if I say, let me walk with you and find out what your priorities are, they're giving me their data. So now we're walking through their home. They're saying, this is important to me. That's important and I'm making notes. How soon do you need that done? How will you know when the job is done? And now they have communicated with me what is important to them. All I have to do at the end is I have to wrap that up in a way that makes them comfortable that yes, I am in fact capable of delivering on their requests. And if I can't deliver on their requests, I have to either sell them a different package. I have to say that's part of a deep cleaning package or that's part of an upsell package. That would be maintenance cleaning instead of daily chores or whatever. And you break it down and explain it to them so that it makes sense of these packages that you see here. Where do you see us you know, working, working something out? And then it becomes their data again. They're the one that's, that made the choice. And so if I'm the one making the choice and I'm giving the price and I'm sending the proposal, that's my data. And it's very hard to sell when I'm pushing something on them. And one of the things that I love, I love mystery movies. I love detective stories. If you've ever watched Dateline, you can sit there and watch the same thing over and over. It's like a loop. You watch it over and over again, but you want to you find out what happens next, right? People love discovering things. And so when people discover things on their own, they get really excited about it because it's their discovery. And so I want people to discover how we can work together. I want them to be involved in the process. And it's a very, very different process as far as sales goes than if I just train you something and you take notes and you say yes or no at the end. So I never really heard it presented quite that way of, of you want their data and then you are kind of able to respond and, you know, uh, make a determination kind of based on that data. But that really kind of narrow focuses that you responding to their need because they'll, they'll tell you exactly what they need. I think sometimes, you know, packages uh, from the sales perspective, uh, I know as a consumer, sometimes I'm like, all right, well, these all kind of look good, but I'm not quite sure. But I would almost say if you're able to explain 
or, or find out what they want and explain like, hey, this package I think is best, but we do have this and this, you still get the sales benefit of having, you know, package selling. But I think it, it kind of resonates um, a bit more. So with that said, would the first step perhaps to kind of establishing a presence uh, within the sales call or, or within a meeting be the appropriate questions? Do you think there's too much emphasis on kind of what you're ready to say and not so much of what you should be asking? Absolutely. In the house cleaning business, and I don't know if this is true for other businesses, but I know in the house cleaning business, people will pick up the phone and they call you or they text you. They now text and they say, can you give me a price? How much it would cost to clean four bedrooms? Uh, okay. I can give you a price. Yes, I can. And our first instinct is to say, well, it'll cost $210 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. The real question is the question. You ask me, how much does it cost for four bedrooms? Are those bedrooms connected to bathrooms? And did you want those bathrooms also cleaned with the bedrooms? Of those bedrooms, are they all active? Is someone living in those bedrooms right now or are two of those guest rooms? And so you start narrowing down what, what exactly are we talking about? And did you only want the bedrooms clean? Is this an Airbnb? Because if it's an Airbnb, we're not talking about a biweekly clean. We're talking about two or three times a week if you're flipping those rooms. Is there a kitchen that's associated with this house that you want cleaned as well? Is there a living room? Is there a sitting room? Is there a hallway? Is there a music room? Is there a weight room? What, what else is in the house? Would those ever need to be cleaned as well? I want to make sure I give you the most accurate price. And so I don't want to say it's 60 questions, but there are about 60 questions that you can ask somebody in order to pre-qualify them to find out if they are the right person for you to work with. And I can't, I, I can, sure, I can just make up a price, but that doesn't serve you and it doesn't serve me. Because if I get over to your house to, to clean the house at a certain price and I find out that there's all sorts of other things going on, I have to, it's a bait and switch. I have to change my pricing. And then you're going to be angry with me. And then you're going to write me a bad rating and review. And you're going to say, you tricked me. Well, yes, I tricked you because I wasn't willing to go through the steps to find out what your data was. But if I find out what your data is, here's the trick. This is the trick. If I ask you a series of questions and you are price shopping, you have to stop what you're doing and you have to make a commitment. Am I really price shopping or did I need my problem solved? And if I found someone that is actually taking interest in my problem and they're willing to help me solve it, am I willing to give them that time to give them the questions or the answers so that they can give me an accurate price? Because my only goal in this conversation is to get to the accurate price, but here's the catch. I probably cannot give you an accurate price until I still see your home. So what I would like to do after I've asked a series of questions, I can give you a range. And then I'm going to be in your neighborhood this afternoon at four o'clock. I would love to swing by and just take a look. You can go over your priorities with me. And then if we're a good fit, great. We can put something on the calendar. And if we're not, no harm, no foul. At least you'll have a price for your price shopping. And people are like, okay, that's fair. But here's the thing. If they've answered my questions, they're invested. And because they are invested and it is their data, now they have an interest in me coming over. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You know, everything is digital nowadays, but if this uh, conversation was on an old tape, the part you just said would be the part that is worn out from being rewound and, and replayed <laughs> again. It's, I mean, it, it, was, it was brilliant the way you put it, but it really goes to show, you know, we're in those conversations, kind of the mentality that you need, but you brought up re reviews and obviously, you know, for, for a nice job and reputation uh, marketing, that's, that's, absolutely huge and imperative. But I always say that bad reviews are a failure to meet expectations. Sometimes those expectations are unrealistic. We see reviews where someone said, you know, they said uh, it would take two hours and I they took two and a half. Like, okay, well, it actually should have taken three, but we're really good. We got down to two. Um, but sometimes, you know, there is some, you know, fault in the business or it just comes down to an expectation was either unrealistic, but ultimately is, is not met. Um, and it, it sounds like, you know, from what you're saying is you kind of ensure before any work's even done or anything's really assigned that the expectations that you are laid out um, come from the data that they've given you um, and, and match, you know, what you're planning to do, but you, you want to make sure that the, the ground is set before you begin anything. Um, I wonder in a lot of these conversations, I'm sure you pick up a lot of, you know, frequently asked questions and, and common questions. Um, and we hear a lot of times of people saying, I would love to put like an FAQ on my website, but how do I decide, like, is it a top 10? Is it 30? As someone that, that has, you know, many channels, things like that, where it's, you know, ask you a question, you'll kind of answer. Um, how, how did, I'll say almost how did that start, but 
what goes into, hey, I've heard this enough. I really need to get it out there and spread it to the masses. And what are the benefits that you see from pre-answering questions like that? Um, so first to uh, answer the frequently asked questions, and then I will um, move over to how I personally answer them because you hit on two really important things. The first one is, yes, I'm a firm believer in frequently asked questions. When you go through the Savvy Cleaner training, which is our training company, we have frequently asked questions we want you to put on your website because it will prevent somebody that's just price shopping and it will get rid of them before they call you and spend your time trying to answer those questions that could already be answered. Things like, do you work on the holidays? Do you charge more for the holidays? What are your working hours? Do you come alone or are you a team? There are things like that that are just common questions that can be on your frequently asked questions page. The second part, which is how I do this personally, is I do get hundreds of questions. And so in order to answer hundreds of questions, you have to ask the question, how can I leverage my time? Because we all only have 168 hours in a week. And amongst those hours, you have working hours, you have marketing hours, you have family hours, you have personal hours and so on. And so you have to be very specific with your time. So if I get asked the same question 30 times in a day, that's my fault. That's my fault because I haven't figured out a way to leverage my time. So for me, I started a YouTube channel, Ask a House Cleaner. <laughs> and so you get to ask a house cleaning question and I will help you find an answer. And so what this is, is somebody asks a question and we believe that all questions are valid. It, there are no stupid questions because if somebody asked the question, it's information that they're looking for. And so we wanna honor that in the most respectful way. And so by answering a question on camera, it's a little bit different than if I just text it out in an email. Because with email, you don't hear my voice, you don't see my face. Maybe sometimes I can, you know, have a big gesture and then you're like, oh, she meant something big or whatever. I can explain it a little bit better. And then if you missed something, you can go back and rewind it again and again. So with the YouTube questions, it came as a result of people asking lots of the same questions. So like a frequently asked questions page, we have a database now of over a thousand videos we've created. And so when someone asks a question, we can say, oh, that was episode 582. And so we can just add the link in there and that answers their question and they can watch a video on that specific topic. And then if they have more questions, they can come back. So the goal is not to make people feel stupid, but to serve them in a way that doesn't require you to answer the same question 20 or 30 times a day because nobody has that kind of time. They just don't. And I know you've had some good success on YouTube but you at no point during that, uh, you know, kind of explanation talk about like, well, I was, I thought the more views would help me. And I thought, you know, if I got more likes, things like that. So many people go into, you know, making a YouTube video or things like that of, of trying to think of succeeding at YouTube, but you talked about being able to answer and say, Hey, this was episode, you know, so-and-so and so, uh, or, you know, whatever number it's, it probably worked the same with social media channels. So if you're doing something like on a job, being able to show something off, uh, you know, answer a, a frequently asked question at that point. Um, I'm sure you absolutely could use that in a future discussion of saying like, oh, well, I actually cleaned a similar floor like this or, or dealt with a particular window uh, in, in things of that nature. I think uh, that that database would be helpful, but how do you, like, what is the organizational like? I, this is the question I really wanted to ask you when I first looking in, uh, like I said, when I first that nice job and kind of came across you is, is, what type of system goes into organizing all the information that you are putting out there on YouTube? I love that question. I love that question. Organization is the key. Um, so for me, I'm not, I, I'm not techni te techno savvy. See, I can't even say the word. I'm not <laughs> techno savvy at all. I was a house cleaner. I push a vacuum. I wipe counters down to try to move into YouTube space was completely foreign to me. And so what I had to say to myself is looking into the future, is video going away? And the answer is no, it's not. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to learn something I don't know. And so for me, it was, let's dive into this. Let's figure it out. It's gonna be super clunky. It's gonna be bad. It's gonna look awful. I was wearing braces on my teeth, whatever, but let's go ahead and figure it out because by the time I figure it out, then I will be caught up with society and society will still be doing videos. But if I don't figure this out, I'm going to get left behind. And so for me, it was literally figuring out what does that look like for me? And what it looked like for me is I don't, again, I, I want to leverage my time. I don't want to keep recreating things over and over and over again. And now you're expected to be on social media and you're expected to be on this channel and that channel and blogs and ah, da, 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 da. how do you do it all? I don't know. 
And so what I decided for me, I'm one person. When I started out, I was one person. I didn't have a team. It was me. I have no techno skills. I would love to show you how I clean everything in the house, but I don't even know how to do the camera and the lighting and the microphone. I don't know how that works. What can I do? So I started where I was. I'm one person. I can stand in front of one camera. I can put the camera on a tripod. I can put a light behind it. I can stand in one spot and I can answer a question. That I can do. I'm 100% confident I could do that. So that's where I started. And I started with the backdrop that's behind me. It's a trade show fabric display that stays behind me because I wasn't even smart enough to do green screen. Take what you know and make it work. You don't have to know all the secrets, just take what you know and make it work. As the show got better, then I started monetizing the show and I started bringing in sponsors and I started adding in B-roll and I started adding in licensed stock photography and other ways to help illustrate my points. But you have to start where you are. So for me, what, what is that? Is it a podcast or is that a YouTube show? And I said, it's both. It's both because there are people that walk their dogs. There are people that are driving in their car. There are house cleaners that are going to a job that could listen to a five to eight minute show on the way that they're, they're not gonna watch a YouTube show, okay? So there are, different, there are different things. How do I do that? So how I do that, I wear a little microphone on my lapel. That is my podcast. I stand in front of a, a camera. That is my YouTube show. I record them at the same time. Then I edit the audio and that becomes the podcast. Then we snap it together and that becomes the YouTube show. Once we take the YouTube show, we send that to Rev and they do all of our transcriptions for us. And that is word by word what the, the, the show is about. We take that and those become the closed captions for the YouTube show. So it can now be translated into 191 languages. Then once we have that transcription, oh, wait a second, we could edit that into a blog. So as we're adding in the B-roll for the video, what we do is we shrink all of the images to 35%. That goes in a file with a transcription and that goes to the blog editor who turns that into a blog. So every day we create three original pieces of content. It's the same content, but it is the YouTube show, the podcast, and the blog. So people that want to read and skim through it, they have that. People that want to listen while they're driving, they have that. People that want to watch the YouTube show, they have that. One of the things that's really interesting that I found, and this is going to break your heart, because you have an awesome podcast, but people consume content differently as a podcast than they do as a YouTube show. So as a podcast, we've been doing this every single day for almost three years. And we have like 250 reviews on iTunes. Woo! But on YouTube, we've got 90,000 subscribers. And so people consume information differently. If they're out walking their dog, they're not going to leave you a rating and review. They're not going to engage with your content. They heard it. They love it. They love you. You're amazing. You changed their life and you will never know that. Okay. And you have to be okay with that. People are driving in their car. They're, you know, watching for other cars and drivers and accidents and pedestrians and deer. They're not going to stop and write you a rating and review while they're in their car. It will never happen. And so you'll think, oh, well, should I still do the podcast? Yes, you should. Podcasts are bigger than they've ever been. And it gives you amazing SEO. And so, yes, you should still do it, but leverage the time so that you have both the podcast and the YouTube show. Okay, so when we're done with that, then what? Well, then you can repurpose different pieces of that for your social media. And so there are ways that you can utilize the information over and over again. But for me, it was a huge learning curve because to do that, as you know, it takes a lot of time. Nobody that's ever not created a show, they have no idea how long a podcast and a YouTube show and a blog take. They have no idea. Yeah. And life already was full. I didn't have like extra hours in a day to figure this out. But I said, if I do this every single day, it's like training for the marathon. You do it every single day, every single day, every single day, it becomes part of your life. You start shifting around other activities until you have that because that is, that is your goal. And there has to be a reason why you're doing it. For me, it was the quickest, fastest way to get where I wanted to go in a brand new marketplace where I'd never been online. I'd never marketed my services online. Nobody had ever heard of me outside of my, my world where mm -hmm. we, were, we worked off of referral only. Why do I need social media? <laughs> well, because the rest of the world is on social media. The rest of the world is online. And so if you're going to play in the online space, you have to be known online. You have to take those steps. And so if you're going to show up to the race, you got to have the right shoes, you got to have the right outfit, you got to have the right training, and you got to be, you got to be in the race. And so it comes down to what are you willing to do? And in order to answer that question, you also have to know what you're not willing to do. And so every day I get pitched probably 30 to 100 things that are products, 
uh, sponsorships, things like that, that people want me to help them represent. And I have to look at it really quickly and I have to make hard, fast decisions and say, that's not in alignment with our brand. And so thank you. I, I wish you well, not for us. And I have to say no way, way, way more than I say yes. And so you have to be willing to know what you don't do as well. And I, the very beginning of that, there, there's the old phrase like content is king. And so many people think that it's how many pieces of content, but the true essence of that is what is in that content. And you talked about it. You start it off, it's a tripod, it's a light, it goes in it. It's become, it's grown, you know, as it evolved and it became all this. But if you weren't answering questions in a way that passed along knowledge, was easily to digest things like that, then it's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't become king. You know, it would, ju- it would just be nothing out there. So uh, I think that's a great message to don't worry about, you know, the barriers to start. Because once you start, you can improve, you can get better, and you can turn it into. And, and you know, the system that, that you kind of have there, perhaps someone that's not something that they're ready to kind of take on. But we go back a couple of questions ago of there's content that you've created that can help on the sales level, on the training level, on, on the brand level, so much. And that's where the content is king comes in, but the content actually has to resonate and absolutely has to connect um, can, Angela, can I add, can yeah, I add one sure. thing to that? Uh, just real briefly, um, you have to also be willing to do what you're able to do. So if you have a family and you have other responsibilities, you might only be able to do a very limited amount of content. And so for me, I've seen people that have hour long podcasts and I'm like, go, that's awesome. But for me, instead of having an hour long content every day, I decided I could take that one hour and I could break it up into seven, eight minute segments. It's the same hour, but that gives me seven different chances for search engine optimization. And then if you heard something today that was of interest to you, you might come back tomorrow. And if you heard something today and you're like, nah, not for me, I didn't lose you for a whole week until you came back again for the next podcast. I came back again tomorrow and I'm like, hey, Sean, how about this? No, not for me. Okay, how about this? And every day I got a new chance to try to win you back, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was, what am I able to do? I'm, I'm able to do about an hour of content a week, but I had to break it up into smaller segments. So we have a short show. Our shows are five to eight minutes on average. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, for, that's a sweet spot and a like as someone like coming from, you know, a a media or a content sort of side of it, you know, studied for many years, studied fan cultures for many years. It's, it's always evolving. I don't think there's anything that's, it's a true hard and fast rule, but it comes to the mentality said is the content that you're putting out there has to have some relevance. It might not, you know, if you have something that's, that sounds amazing and it looks like you shot it on a potato instead of an HD camera, <laughs> you know, but if that message gets through, that's going to help you in the long run. Then if it, it could win several awards for editing, but really didn't say anything. Um, so Angela, you know, I, we could talk for a while uh, about a variety of different topics. Um, perhaps maybe I should have cut it into, uh, you know, 20 smaller episodes. Um, but I want to thank you for uh, sharing time with us today uh, and, and really helping, um, you know, bring your expertise to our audience um, for, for two reasons. One, I think it's helpful for small business owners, but also I always want to make sure that we are, are kind of supporting the people out there. They're doing things for small business owners to help the business at large. So, uh, you know, thank you from that perspective. And thanks once again for, uh, for coming on our show here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I love talking with you. I just love spinning ideas. And this is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, We will have some links. If you're watching live, the links won't be coming just yet. We'll have some links so you can find uh, some more of Angela uh, below. But if Angela, if someone has a question, if someone wants to reach out to you, where should we send them? Askahousecleaner.com. So easy. Love it. Love it. (laughs) Uh, Angela Brown, thank you so much. And for all of you out there, we did it. End of season one, but don't worry. It's going to be a very short break. We'll be back second week of November. Not going to tease the guest just yet, um, but we'll be back with more insights uh, and some fun uh, and some great tips for you. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you get a chance to share it, go ahead and do it, like it. But even if you don't do any of that, as Angela said, if you're walking the dog, if you're driving or anything like that, just take something from this podcast and try it execute it and see if it'll work for you. So for myself and everyone here at Nice Job, we remind you to stay healthy, stay safe, and don't forget to have a little fun out there as well. Take care, everybody.